received Cesar Sanchez. Cesar Sanchez is PhD in, in microbiology and since more than 10 years um, he is full-time editor. He was previously editor of Trends in Microbiology, Nature Review Microbiology. And um, till uh, about five years, I think, um, is senior editor of Nature Communication. And today he will give you a seminar entitled How to Get Published in Nature and its sister journal. So, her. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, this is how to get published in Nature and other Nature journals, but, but most or, 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 or a lot of, of this talk is going to be relevant to publishing in other journals too, because we, I'm going to talk about the review, the peer review process, and what happens after you submit your paper and it, it gets accepted. So there are many things that are relevant to other journals, not just to Nature journals. But it's mostly, but there are, there are some peculiarities of the Nature journals. Right, so that's the that's um, So basically, I will try to explain the differences between the different nature journals. You, have, you know we have nature, and then we have nature microbiology, <coughs> nature immunology, nature, 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 many nature journals. So what, are they the same thing? Are they different? In which ways they are different? Um, and also, I try to explain how the editors make decisions on which papers <coughs> we reject or which papers we set up for review or how we make the decisions after review and how we decide whether to accept the paper or not. So a little bit about me. So I'm originally Spanish. I did a, I, well, first of all, I did, a, I did a biology degree general biology, and then a PhD at the University of Oviedo, Spain. Uh, it was basically bacterial genetics, more specifically regulation of um, ribosomal protein expression in Streptomyces bacteria. Streptomyces bacteria produce many antibiotics and anti-cancer drugs, and, and they have, these are bacteria that are multicellular, so they have a complex life cycle, and they form spores to weird, weird things. Um, then I did uh, about 10 years of postdoctoral research working mostly on the biosynthesis of antibiotics and anti-cancer drugs produced by this group of bacteria. Um, so first at the University of California, Davis, and then back at the University of Vienna. And then in, in 2008, I moved to the UK to start my editorial career. And my first job was at Trends in Microbiology, which is a reviews journal. We publish only review articles. And then Nature Reviews Microbiology and the News and Views section of Nature. And finally, since 2013, at Nature Communications. And at Nature Communications, I handle microbiology papers. Uh, <coughs> so when I started, we were only about let's say 20 editors in the journal, so we had to handle many different sorts of papers. Now we are 80 something editors just for nature communication, so we are kind of getting more specialized. So at the moment I'm handling mostly uh, any microbiology related to bacteria and fungi, that's my main thing. But that's from basic microbial cell biology to pathogenesis, microbiome, uh, new antibiotics, new antimicrobials, so it's still quite diverse. Well, Nature, everybody knows Nature, the journal. It was founded you know, a very long time ago, um, and they, they aim to be you know, the world's leading global scientific journal. They publish papers across all the scientific disciplines, from biology, chemistry, astronomy, physics medicine. And the, the, the mission of the journal from, from the beginning was to communicate the best and most important science. Um, in principle, uh, communicate this science to, to other scientists, that's the main, the main readership of nature, um, but also to the wider community. So, you know, many people read nature or some articles in nature and they're not necessarily scientists. So those articles need to be written in a way that many people are able to understand. Right? So 
So what makes a Nature paper? What, what's special about a paper published in Nature? Is it, are they special in any way? What papers published in Nature are supposed to report the most significant advances with the widest implications? That's the ideal paper, right? Uh, the significance of the findings, the relevance of the findings, should be obvious by people not working in that particular field. So with, with this I mean that a, a, a physics paper published in Nature, you know, the relevance of the paper should be understandable by most people here. You know, if you're a biologist or a clinician, the relevance of the paper should be obvious to you. Not the details, not the, not the technical details, but, but if you read the title and a little bit of the asset, you know, oh, this is important because of, that, of something. But you know, there are many, many papers that cannot make it in nature because they don't report, you know, the white, uh, uh, the most significant advances. Um, they are not very widely relevant. So what happens with all those papers that are still excellent, amazing papers? So that's why there are so many nature journals. Right? So um, you can think of the, of the different nature journals in terms of three levels, if you want. So you can imagine that there is a, a gradient, a degree of selectivity, importance, impact in the papers that they publish. So nature will publish, will publish the papers uh, the most important findings, the most widely relevant findings, and it's extremely, extremely selective. So they publish very, very few papers of the many, many papers that they receive every day. Then on the second level, you have the Nature Research Journals, which are over 20 journals now, which are subject specific. So they don't publish across all the sciences, but it's nature immunology or nature genetics. So they're specific. For, for one particular um, subject. And then you have a third layer with nature communications. Um, nature communications is, like nature, multidisciplinary. So we, we publish, again, across all the natural science, sciences, physics, chemistry, medicine, biology, all the sciences. But the level of selectivity is lower, and the papers we publish are not considered to be as relevant or important that the papers of nature or the nature journals publish. Right? So this is a degree there, and obviously that the, 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 um, the level of importance or impact of the paper is obviously to some extent uh, subjective, right? It's a matter of opinion to some extent. So what's uh, the difference between the nature paper and a paper publishing, let's say, nature cell biology. Um, a paper published in a nature research, you know, reports the most significant advances within that particular discipline. So in this case, the best papers within cell biology would be published in nature cell biology. But still, the relevance of the findings should be clearly understandable by every cell biologist and beyond that. So a paper published in cell biology, the relevance of the findings should be obvious to <coughs> most other biologists in general. Right? Yeah. So there are, as I said, there are many nature journals now. These are the life sciences journal from you know, nature immunology, Nature Microbiology, Nature Medicine, and many others. There are physical science journals, like Nature Astronomy, or Geoscience, or Energy, Biomedical Engineering. And, but there are, there are some common characteristics for all the nature journals. Is that the first one is that they are highly selective, with nature being the most highly selective, the nature research journals a little bit less selective, the na nature communications a little bit less selective. But they are all highly selective, and they reject many more papers than they receive. 
sorry, they, they, they reject a, a, a very big chunk of the papers that they receive. Um, um, the papers that they publish tend to be high impact. Another difference with uh, another characteristic that is common to all the nature journals, all the journals with the word nature <coughs> in the name, is that <coughs> the journal is run by a team of full time professional editors. Right? So it's people like me. So we don't do research anymore. We used to do research in the past, but we don't do it anymore. So we are fully dedicated to the journal. That's our only job. Um, and that's common for all the nature journals. Um, you know, many, uh, and this happens also for, let's say, science, cell uh, journals published by Cell Press. There are all the journals out there with, with, with professional in house editors, but most other journals in the world are run by academic <coughs> editors like, like you guys. Right? And despite we are called nature, whatever. We are different journals, so we are editorially independent. That means that if you submit a paper to Nature, I, I will never know unless you tell me. Right? We are different journals, different sets of editors. And if you submit to Nature and they reject your paper, uh, that doesn't make any difference to me if you submit the paper to, to Nature Communications afterwards. So, that's, so being rejected by another Nature journal is, is not something <coughs> negative in, in the way we, we see your paper. <coughs> now, there are also differences among the nature journals. Um, nature and the nature research journals have limited space. They are very, very selective. So they can publish only a limited number of papers every month or every year. They have this limitation. And they, they, they aim to publish the most important research with the widest implications. So what happens with the other papers that still are great papers, but don't make it up there? So that, that was the reason <coughs> for launching Nature Communications. So Nature Communications is part of the Nature Research Group of Journals. It's a nature journal. so. Um, those, those characteristics I mentioned before are shared by Nature Communications. But it's like nature itself is multi and interdisciplinary. We publish across all the sciences. And when we select papers, we, we're looking for significant advances within the particular field. So we're not looking for the widest implications or we're not looking on at looking for papers on very hot topics only because that's going to make the news or anything like that. We're looking for significant advances. Is this paper make, uh, going to make a difference in the field, in this particular field? So, and our papers go from, you know, um, typical research papers to um, proof of concepts to new methods, all sorts of, of research. Um, so broad appeal is not uh, required for publication in nature communications. So something that is going to be very important for uh, uh, a particular um, area, that's enough for us. If it's going to be to make a difference in that field, that's enough. So the journal was launched in 2010. Um, and last year, this is the number of papers we've published. And last year, we published uh, already over 4,000 papers. We are online only, so there is no print version. And because we are online only, we don't have the constraints that print journals have in terms of length, manuscript length, or we still have recommendations about, you know, if, the, if you can do, write a manuscript in 5,000 words, don't write it in 8,000 words, right? But we have some recommendations that we are flexible. Um, and another big difference with any other nature journals is that we are fully open access. So all the other nature journals are subscription-based, which means that um, 
to read the articles, you need to be a subscriber or work for a university or an institution um, that subscribes to the journal. Whereas for um, Nature Communications, all the articles are publicly available for everybody to read. Impact factor is 12, so basically we are the highest impact multidisciplinary open access journal. And we have offices in London, that's the, the main office, but now um, we are having more and more editors being going to Shanghai, New York, and Berlin. Now, you probably have seen this before. This is, I think this is really funny, right? What, what, happens, what happens when you submit your paper? That's kind of the feeling very often, right? You, you get very often, you submit the paper, and, and it's just a torture going through the process, right? But what happens once you submit your paper? Um, let's start with the very beginning. Um, how do you select the journal? You have a paper, you're preparing, you're writing a paper. How, how do you decide which or not to submit your paper? Um, well, I would say you would, you would like to, to ask yourself this kind of question, right? Who did you want to read your work? I mean, maybe your work is very, very, very technical, very specific, and, and maybe only people within your particular field are going to be interested in reading it. Maybe you, then you, should, you could submit to, you know, to a specialty journal uh, or, or something like that. Or, um, yeah, where does it fit in the field? Is it, uh, <coughs> is it going to, to, to make a huge difference? Is when, when people in your field read the paper are going to say, well, yeah, I know the paper, you know, on this topic. Or they're going to say, oh, wow, look, I never thought about this possibility, right? That, that, kind, of, that kind of question in, may help you to understand what the potential <coughs> impact of your paper could be. It's from I mean from, from the, the the point of view of an editor, it's really, really important to prepare the paper well. You know, the version that you submit to the journal should be really, really well thought and, and prepared. <coughs> um, so I'm talking about the clear structure, it's clearly written. You don't need to be Shakespeare and write beautiful English. It's just about clarity. When when someone reads the paper and they, they, they need to understand what you're trying to say. And so, what were the goals of the research? Uh, what were the key questions? And what, what are the, the key conclusions? Th that should be very, very clear. Um, so please avoid overselling your work. That's, that's not really good. You know, when you read, sometimes you read the title and the abstract of the paper, and you think, oh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. And then you go into the paper, and it's actually, you know, it's like a minor, really, really minor thing they did related to that, and but that's what they put in the title. That's, that's not good. It's just not um, from an editor's perspective, but think about the reviewers. You know, the, the reviewers will know exactly, because they're, they're people in your field, so they know exactly that, you, that what you're saying there is not, it's not true. Right? Um, and describe all the relevant experimental procedures. The method section is extremely important. And, uh, you know, quite often we send the paper out for review, and one of the reviewers says, it looks okay to me, but I can't really say because they don't really explain how they did this experiment. So basically that's one round of review wasted. So we need to ask the authors to revise, then we send the paper back to the same reviewers, and then the reviewer may say, now that I see the details, this is very poorly done, right? This is flawed. So the methods is extremely important. And also reading the guide to authors and, and complying with journal policies. Um, you know, different journals have different policies and for some journals, the <coughs> format of the first version you submit is extremely important. <coughs> it's not for us, it's not for, for the nature journals. The format of the first version of the manuscript doesn't matter as long as everything is there. Uh, the format is, is not important, um, but some of the journals care about that. So, just just read the the journal's um, guide to authors to make sure that you know the first version is going to be okay. 
Now, when writing the paper, it's important to, to provide context for your findings, for your work. So basically, what is the problem that you are trying to solve? And why? Why are you doing this? Why is this important? Why, why should anybody care about this? And, and trying to, to focus um, about the most important details, the, the key message. Right? Don't, don't, don't spend a lot of text spending something that is not central to the paper. Just focus on the main, the main messages. And then, if someone reads your paper and says, well, so what? Yes, you think all this work is ama technically amazing, but why? So what? I mean, what's, why, why did you do this? And what, what, what's, um, what's the relevance of all this? So you should try to respond to that question in your paper. Right? So when the reader reads your paper, they understand, you did this because of this, and this is important because of that. And clarity, clarity is also important. Again, it's not about great English language. It's just about clear writing, right? Um, and the figures are also important. Um, they should speak for themselves. Basically, <coughs> if you if you look at the figure and 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 read the legend, you should be able to understand everything in the figure without actually going back to the paper and see the details. <coughs> <coughs> the cover letter. Some people think cover letters are useless, and, and some editors think that also too. Uh, some other people think cover letters are useful. I think they are useful when they're done, when they're properly done. If you do um, a cover letter that doesn't have anything, then it's useless. Um, so it should be a standalone document that complements the manuscript. Because we're going to read the manuscript, but we're going to have a look at the cover letter too. Um, it's kind of a summary of the whole work, but emphasizing what has been done and why is this important. Uh, for some journals, it's also very important that you make clear in the cover letter why this particular work is suitable for this specific journal, especially if the journal is um, subject specific. Right? And it should not be a copy of the abstract, because we already have the abstract. You can suggest referees in your cover letter. Um, think about people who might help you to improve the paper or the work. Um, don't suggest, you know, former supervisors, relatives, friends, you know, uh, collaborators. And you can also exclude some referees. Um, people who you think they won't be able to provide a fair um, a report about your paper. And usually for us, it, I mean, you can exclude up to three people and that's fine. And we don't need to know exactly the reasons why you exclude them. If you exclude up to three people, that's fine, we, we honor that. But if you exclude five, eight people, <laughs> or a whole field, like sometimes happens, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult to find reviewers for the paper. And if there are any papers, um, if you're working on, on, on a similar subject and you have another manuscript in preparation or submitted elsewhere, it's, it's important that to mention that in the cover letter because if they overlap in some way, we would like to know the, how the degree of overlap, right? Because we, we want to, because then the other paper may be, you know, um, getting a little bit of the novelty or the mass <laughs> of your paper. This is the, the editorial process in general, which is I would say it's mostly valid for most journals. Um, so in, <coughs> in our journals, um, we get new submissions, new papers, but we also get papers rejected from other nature journals that the authors transfer to, let's say, nature communication. So those are the two paths for submission. So the first editorial decision is whether 
we send the paper out for review or we reject. That's the first editorial decision. Um, we reject without review between 60 and 80% of the papers we get. And that varies across journals, but also, for instance, in our case, it varies across disciplines. So in some areas, the reject rate is higher than in some other areas. So the papers that go out for review, then uh, we select reviewers. Uh, the reviewers submit the reports, hopefully in time. And based on these reports, we make the second editorial decision. And this second editorial decision is usually either um, revise or reject. That's, those are the two main decisions after review. Most papers go through two rounds of review in our journals. Um, and eventually, some of them will be accepted. <coughs> so as I said, um, the first decision is whether to send the paper out for review. We usually make the first decision within a week of submission. So at least we don't waste your time right? to get the no after we, OK, you can move on quickly. Um, we go for impact, not impact factor. With this, I mean, again, the, that um, you know, impact factor basically correlates with the number of citations that your paper is going to receive at some point. But you know, some topics or some areas are highly cited, and some other topics, some other areas are not that highly cited. And that's the nature, and, and that's because um, some topics are really hot, or some topics you have large communities of people working on the same thing, so that advances very quickly, they publish lots of papers, so they cite each other very, 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 very often. And some other areas are small areas with very few people working, so we have to, to look at that. Um, so when, when, when we say impact, we mean impact within that particular area. So the same kind of data or experiments um, within this area, within this small area, maybe um, may 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 um, uh, produce a significant impact. It will make a difference in this small field. Whereas the same kind of work in this other area, which is big and lots of people doing the same thing, the impact of that thing is going to be smaller. So when we look at, at two papers like this, we will favor this one because this one is going to make a difference. Whereas this second one, even if you look at the techniques and everything, they look very similar. But this one is not going to make a big difference because it's just another paper within thousands of papers. So at least, so every single manuscript we receive is assigned to an editor. So that's your handling editor and the person who will um, send you the, the editorial decision. So that at least one editor reads your paper, but usually we discuss the paper with other editors. And, and the main reason for that is obviously that we're not experts in everything, right? So I'm not expert in all the areas that I handle. So I have to discuss the immunology aspects with the immunology editor or the evolutionary aspects with the evolutionary editor or all, all like that, right? Um, and we read many, many manuscripts a year. So again, we, we have to reject most of these papers. We, we usually have between, we usually have three referees per paper, sometimes two, sometimes four, with some complicated papers using many different techniques. Sometimes you need one reviewer who knows exactly this technique, or some reviewer you know, who knows statistics, or some reviewer, right? So for some papers which are very complex, you may need more than four reviewers. But it's usually it's about three, around three reviews per paper. And we aim to, to make the, the second decision after review within four or five weeks. But that depends, obviously, on the reviewers replying to our messages, accepting the invitations, and submitting the reports. So we try to, um, to have reviewers covering all the main aspects of the paper. Um, 
So if, if the paper is very simple in the sense that they're using a single technique, it's going to be very easy, usually you, with two reviewers, that, that's probably enough. But if the paper is multidisciplinary, you have biochemistry and genetics and immunology, um, then you're probably going to need at least three reviewers, and, and each one may be looking at the paper from different perspectives. So that's important when you receive the report. One reviewer may be focusing on something very specific, and you may wonder why is, is this person not commenting on other aspects? And that's because that's, that's their expertise. So there's another reviewer or reviewers covering the other aspects. So ideally, you, we would like to have reviewers with know very, very well the techniques, but also you want them, maybe you have another reviewer or the same reviewer who is able to, to give an opinion about how this paper or how this work is going to affect the field. So someone with a, with a broader view of the field. So that's the ideal situation. We usually ask reviewers to provide the report within 10 days or two weeks. That, that's uh, that's what we usually say. Very often they come back, you know, I can't do in 10 days. It's two weeks. Ago. Okay, yes, it's okay. Or 18 days, okay. Most, most of the time it's okay, right? But we, we ask for 10 days. Um, and the ideal reviewer is someone who has already reviewed for us, so we know that they, are, they provide fair reports in general, and they, they are timely, so if they say they're going to submit within 15 days, they actually do that. Um, and that they provide constructive criticism, not just kill the paper, but you know, if there is something um, flaw there, yes, say so, but provide some solution. Right? That's the kind of reviewer that, do we, that we're looking for. So, Always remember that the, the decision, the final decision is made by the editors, not by the reviewers. So um, we take the reviewers' advice very, very seriously, but we don't count both. So if we have three reviewers <coughs> and two say, this is really bad, it's not really going to be a big impact, and another one is very enthusiastic, we may go with the enthusiastic one because maybe the other two are not giving um, good reasons for those for that negative opinion. And so we, we look at the, at the arguments of both sides, and if the negative opinion is not providing reasonable arguments, well, then we can't we can follow that, right? So um, we dis disagree with reviewers sometimes. Either way, sometimes reviewers may be positive, but we decide to reject the paper, right? So mm -hmm. think about um, who makes the final decision, that's the editors. Most papers go through, through two rounds of review. And for borderline decisions, we try to avoid additional rounds of review. So with this, I mean that um, if the paper has already gone through two rounds of review, and the, the, the problems that the paper had on the first round had not been fixed on the second round, then we may decide to reject. Even if we think that they, the authors eventually could fix all the problems, but they had really two opportunities to do that, and, and they haven't. Um, and the, out, the final outcome is, is unclear. So we're trying to save everybody's time, especially reviewers' time. Mm -hmm. But if we think that the work is going to be of interest, that it's going to be, this is a new method that is going to be useful to the field, we can you know, go for another round of review, and you need six months, okay, that's fine. Let's do that work. you know. So um, how to deal with review reports? So as I said, the main, the, 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 the editorial decision is either revise or reject. Um, if we invite you to revise and resubmit, please, please be careful and try to address all the, the concerns raised by the reviewer. Even if you think um, that the reviewer is not being fair or the reviewers are asking for too much, uh, they're asking for too many new experiments that are not really relevant. Just explain so in your response, right? Not just, you know, uh, skip that part. 
please provide re responses to every single point. And obviously stay professional. Even sometimes you know, a reviewer may, be, may sound a bit harsh, right? Uh, and you, you may take it personally. Don't, don't take it personal. Stay professional. Think, you know, cool off, cool it off. You know, wait a couple of days or three days or a week, you know, and once you're, you're back to your normal state, then you can think about uh, how to respond to those. And, and always focus on the science, right? Don't take it personal. Focus on the science and the, science, the scientific arguments. And everybody makes mistakes. Reviewers are human. Editors are humans. We all make mistakes. So don't, don't um, assume that a negative feedback is uh, sometimes it's based just on misunderstanding. Sometimes it's because you didn't describe your experimental procedures very clearly, and the reviewer misunderstood how you did things. So <coughs> we are all human. Um, at Nature Journals, we have different <coughs> types of peer review. The standard peer review is single blind peer review. That means that the, the, the authors don't know the names of the reviewers, but single blind peer review. <coughs> Double blind peer review means that um, the reviewers <coughs> don't know the names of the authors. And you have this option. When you submit to a nature journal, you can select this option. And then you have to obviously remove all the all your names and information from the paper. We at Nature Communications we, we're doing a transparent peer review. This means that the authors, if uh, if we accept the paper for publication, the authors decide whether to have the peer review file published together with the paper. So the peer review file is the all the review reports and the author responses. But that's up to the author once the paper has been accepted. <coughs> so um, some of our papers include the, the peer review reports, others don't. And that's always the author's decision. And we have a portable peer review that basically means that if your paper has been reviewed by another nature journal, and rejected, you can transfer the paper with the reviews. So the second unit have look at the reviews and make their decisions quick. <coughs> if your paper is rejected, you can always appeal. But uh, consider your case realistically. Don't appeal just for appeal. Right? Some, some people do that, you know, they systematically appeal any single project, right? Not many people, um, But always focus on the science. So if you think um, that the editors or the reviewers may, made a clear mistake, you know, that's, that's a good reason for, for an appeal. Um, it's usually very useful if you present new data to make your point. And think, think always about the science, about factual errors, something that you can actually prove that was wrong because, you know, this, look at this reference, what the reviewer said was wrong. Right? <coughs> but also, um, it has to be a major point or a major reason for rejection. If it's just a minor point, something that the reviewer said but wasn't really um, the main reason for, for, reject the, for rejecting the paper is not going to be a successful appeal. And, and you can highlight um, in your appeal how your work is going to make a difference in the field. <coughs> how not to appeal. Your reputation, the number of papers you have published, that your professor, that you have a Nobel Prize, that, that's, that's not relevant. Right? We, we reject, when we reject the paper, we reject that paper, not your CV. Right? It's not, we're not assessing your career, we're assessing that, that particular paper. Um, so don't, don't attack reviewers or editors. Again, if you think uh, one, a reviewer was biased for some reason, that's just explained, but, but don't get it personal. 
general statements about the importance of a field or topic are again not relevant. How can you reject, reject this paper? You know, the microbiome is so important. Yes, but we're not rejecting the microbiome field. We're rejecting this particular field. Don't oversell your results. And just rewriting the paper usually doesn't work. Asking for a new editor or reviewer, unless you have a very, very specific reason to do that, is not very useful. <coughs> and, and this is the transfer system um, of the nature journals. If your manuscript is rejected from any nature journal, you can transfer the manuscript and the review reports if it was reviewed <coughs> to any other nature journal. So usually things move down, right? <laughs> but weird things happen, right? And, and you can submit to any other nature journal. That's always the author of the decision. And, and we have all the scientific reports, which is not a nature journal, but it's part of the same publishing company. And so uh, papers can be transferred to scientific reports. Actually, they, they can be transferred to any journal published by Springer Nature, not the nature journal, so the scientific or scientific reports. Springer Nature published many, many academic journals. So you can transfer papers uh, to any other academic, or any, any other journal published by the company. <coughs> so if the paper is re rejected uh, without review, there's usually a transfer link at the end of the letter. And sometimes the editor recommends a particular journal. So at Nature Communications, we often recommend scientific reports. At other nature journals, they may recommend Nature Communications or another nature journal. Sometimes, if the authors, <coughs> if the authors have, uh, if the authors allow the editors to do that, uh, the editors of the first journal may discuss the paper with the editors of the second journal. Are you guys interested in this paper? We rejected the paper because of this or that, but would you still be interested in this paper? So if the, if the second journal say, yes, we are, so uh, the, when you receive the reject letter, the editor will tell you, OK, this paper is not for our journal, but the editors of this second journal said they will send the paper out for review. Yeah. Or if the paper has been already um, gone through review, they may say, um, this second journal may accept the paper based on the review reports already available, you know. Okay, so that was reject after review. So it's the same thing. So when you submit to a nature journal, you have an option uh, to either allow or not the editors of that journal to discuss the paper with the editors of other nature journal. It's always the, the author's uh, decision. And again, if the paper was rejected at one nature journal, it doesn't mean that it's going to be seen as something negative mm -hmm. at, the next, at the second nature journal. And that's basically it. <laughs> Any questions? Um, in the process of transfer, um, <coughs> You can submit in another journal, but are you? Is it mandatory to, to say that you have a previous number in another nature journal before you submit in the second one in nature? No, I mean if you use the transfer system, um, obviously the second journal receives no yes, but notes, if, but you can fact, submit fresh. You do not use the transfer system, if but you two months it. after you <coughs> decide to, to submit the paper in another nature journal. Is it mandatory to have the previous number or not? No, no, no. You can no. submit as a fresh submission, and, and we will never know that was submitted to another nature journal. And that's fine, you know, because papers you know, often get submitted to different journals, and, and that's not, that's OK. Well, one thing that uh, <coughs> I'm giving uh, annually the same, same kind of course <laughs> to youngsters. The, the other thing is that, uh, that uh, uh, people need to know not to be too much uh, infuriated is that there is a part of luck, of course. A part, sorry? Of luck. 
build that here or not. So this is yeah. part of the story. So we don't want to be desperate, or you want to be, you know, well, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. I mean, this is not science. No, <laughs> editorial decisions it's are not human, science. It's human thing, so yeah. sometimes. And so you don't want to be, you know, make the process of any journal in looking, well, this is yeah. stupid things, I don't publish my wonderful thing. Maybe you try another time and you, your, yes. your, your wonderful thing will be published and the other bullshit will not. Is that, you know, this is a part of it. You, yes. you don't want to take that uh, personally. Exactly. Nothing. Because it's, there is a part of flux that is incompressible. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and everybody makes mistakes. And sometimes, you know, I may look at a paper a year afterwards and I think, why did I read this paper? Maybe I shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah it's worse, but well, in my experience, <laughs> It's worse than that. I, I told uh, people, well, sometimes it depends even on, on the day where it comes. Mm -hmm. You know, some day I'm very, I was very bad humor. <laughs> and the chance this day is not as good as one day when I've been very lucky and uh, very happy and say, oh, I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? So it's not only, uh, it's also depending on the humor of the people, Time, the number of ones that you accept before, the series that you get. So it, there is a part of luck that is incompressible yeah. that we need to accept. That yes. this, this is what it is. And also the way the way the paper is presented. Yeah. Sometimes to read the paper and, it, and you're missing the, the, the point. That they're not really describing the main thing. You know, this this is the main finding and this is important. And you you get lost in, in the text. And sometimes. You know, if you get lost, the, the main, the main message. Yeah, lost. and that will also depend from you. So sometimes you get a good day, maybe it's the day before you drink too much beer, and uh, you cannot concentrate the same way that I don't drink beer. But <laughs> that's possible. So that there is a lot of human things that makes that yeah. it, it does not really. You need to take, of course, very much care of all the answer and take it. I say you really need to, to be very careful when it has been rejected twice. So that means that you need to go back and, and, and go back. But one could be left. Yeah. If you ask for a double blind review, as you said, would the editors also blind or not? No, the editors will know the authors. But they, they, I mean, what's, but what's the point of, of the double blind if you review? The point, I think the main point is to, for the reviewers not to know the identity of the authors because they work in the same field. I think that's the main reason, right? Because you think they are competitors or they, they may not uh, provide a fair report, right? But we don't work in your field. So we don't have any reason to, <coughs> to give an to opinion <coughs> about your work and not about my friends. You know, because we don't work in the field. So we're kind of in, in, in that sense, we are impartial. So in that sense, it makes sense that, that we know the identity of the authors. I mean, it's not that it really matters much to us, but I guess it, it, make, it will make things more complicated logistically. I mean, for the journalists to have triple blind. Uh, I think, no, I think some journalists do that. But, but it's, it's logistically going to be complicated. No, because sometimes you can ask for a particular editor. Yeah, I mean, in, in our case, you can ask for that, but the, the paper is going to be assigned <coughs> to the editor of the right with, with knowledge of the right area, and also depending on workload. So a paper, you know, it may go either to me or to another microbiology editor, <coughs> but then I'm, gonna, I'm really, really busy, so it, it goes to the other editor. So in, in our, for our journal, it doesn't make, uh, it's not very, very, very useful to, to suggest that maybe. <laughs> Do you think that being an editor, stopping doing, stop, when you stop doing your research activities, is a good idea? <laughs> well, it's a good idea. It works for, for us, because right? It's, it's, it's like a business now. You, you, you are far from the research activity and you are reviewing other people's work. Yes, so, exactly. So we're not, we're not, we, don't, we don't do research anymore, but we're still very, very connected to the science and to the research. By reading by reading papers, okay. by coming and visiting the U.S., okay. to, by going to conferences, mm -hmm. and basically by, by talking to people in the community. That's how we are connected to, to the research. But we don't do research anymore. Yeah. Is it sufficient? Mm -hmm. 
Well, it depends on you. I mean, for some some people may not, may not enjoy doing this job. I, I, I really enjoy uh, this job. And that's why I've been doing this for, for this long. But yeah, I mean, some people may may start working as an editor and they realize, no, I really love research. I need to go back to research. That doesn't happen.